And so I want to talk about this UI part. Um, let me give you some background about myself. So I used to be a back-end engineer. My assumption is that's what most of you are as well, because if people are interested in services, in microservices, in architecture in general, they typically are back-end people. That's what I used to be for a long time. Still not a front-end person, but I've changed my view about front-end things drastically. Sort of had, had a sort of epiphany about this whole thing. When I when I went from doing web services to REST, and then found out that this REST thing isn't just about services, but actually about the web as a whole. And that similarly to the way REST is more, and RESTful services are more than just another way to do RPC, the web is more than just another way to do the UI. I found that to be very significant, I found that to have lots of effects on the architectures that I'm helping design. So that's what I want to talk about. So let me start with an obvious way that you want to build your microservice. Right? This is what your, what your architecture looks like. You have these awesome services. They're great. And you built them using some fantastic technology of choice. Whether it's uh, the .NET platform, or Java, or it's build everything in Go, or Clojure, or Scala, it doesn't matter. Your services are great. And this front-end part is obviously what makes use of those services, right? But what's that, actually? What is that? I feel that often when people talk about microservices, they tend to ignore this little detail here. This is just a, you know, that's just the front-end part. It's the unimportant part. That's why it's called the front-end part. Nobody really cares about it. <laughs> what are, wh where does this run? What, what, is, this, is this something that runs in the browser? That it run, does it run on a mobile device? Is it a different kind of server application that runs on the server side and calls my services? Is it a mixture of both? Does it matter? What are those lines? What's, what's that line? What does it, I mean, it's, a, it's an arrow actually. What, is, what does this arrow signify? I, I don't know. Is it the same with that down there? Is this the same kind of communication, or is it a different one? You no, know, I think these things are lost over way too often. I think we should think way more about this. So that's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge us some assumptions. I will try to take a look at things that people tend to believe, and then explain why I think they're wrong, because that's more fun, right? So I'll I hopefully disagree with some of the things that you believe are, are, are correct. I would love for you to disagree loudly and just say, well, you're stupid. That's the most intense and nicest discussion that we can have, and I have a loud voice so I can make sure that I win. <laughs> and I have a mic as a, as a last one. So, let me turn to some assumptions. The first assumption is this one. You know, this orchestration <coughs> thing is cheap. You know, that's like one of those fallacies that Sean mentioned, right? One of the original things, see, you call it one of the things that people typically think, um, but they're, that are typ typically wrong. If I look at these lines here, right? This front end thing is running on the client. And these lines actually span the internet, which is typically the case. And this is far from cheap. It's hugely expensive. It's really hard to make a lot of service calls, service invocations across the network, right? That's something that has a latency of milliseconds. And milliseconds are ages. That's really, really long. Because if you, know, if you aggregate those things, if you have to wait for things that then give you a result that you can use to make the next call, you end up with this, with this cascade of calls to your backend system that will absolutely kill you. It's completely different from these lines down here. These lines down here are some that occur within your data center, right? Those are calls between boxes that sit in the same rack and are connected to some fiber. That's a, that's a completely, you know, that's several orders of magnitude faster uh, than the one you have in the front. Which is why you typically end up with a different architecture. This is, what it, you know, this is what it looks like in the first picture, but then you arrive at something like this. Right? That's what's called the backhand to front end pattern. I don't know how many of you have heard that before. Right? This is something that people do, and it's been popularized by Netflix. Netflix actually does this. And the, one, of the, one of the ideas here is that you, that you aggregate things on the server side in a way that makes it easy and you know, tailored towards the client. So you do all the orchestration on the server side. And I think that's an excellent architecture if you're Netflix. Now, I don't know how many of you here built, how many of you here work at Netflix? Is there anybody here? <laughs> anybody here who built something similar to Netflix? One person, two, one, two. Okay. Who here, like me, builds boring business applications? 
<laughs> you know, that's what we do, right? We fool ourselves if we believe that an architecture that works for a company that has an unlimited amount of money to build specific clients for tons of different platforms is necessarily a good architecture for our systems. My clients at least don't have an unlimited amount of money. Well, some of them actually do, but they're not giving it to me. You know, so I have to make sure that I build something, that I help build something that is reasonable. And I think there are some assumptions in here that we need to challenge as well. I don't like this pattern at all. That's too strong a statement. I think this pattern has its uses, but it's not the general pattern that people think. This is not the default. It should not be the default architecture for your microservices. Because there is one assumption baked into this, which is that the channels matter. The channel being, you know, the, the client platform, the delivery channel through which you reach your users. If that is the first thing, if that is the first discriminating factor before you decide how to split things up, you're, it's like you're, it's, like, it's, it's as if you're splitting up your system as the first thing based on whether it's the database or business logic or orchestration logic or front-end part. It's like slicing things along the wrong lines, carving things apart along the wrong lines. So let me go into more detail about that. We believe that this is the right thing. Right? This is the Netflix model, actually. We have different backend for front ends because we have different front ends. Those different clients are different because they run on different platforms. I've got one client that runs on my PlayStation. I've got another one that runs on my laptop and another one that runs on my iPad. So obviously, if I'm Netflix, I can invest the money to build specific backend for front end systems and to build specific clients for each of those platforms. Most of us don't have that luxury. We just can't do that. We need to get by with a limited amount of different client things. And also, well, we have to imagine more errors. I was too lazy to draw that. This is, this is one thing that, you know, the, the, sheer, the sheer amount of money you have to spend if you want to build specific clients for every, every single channel is one, one thing that should stop you from doing this. The other one I think is even more important, which is that your clients see multiple channels and expect them to use to have one experience, right? So maybe I'll browse a product on my on my uh, on my tablet while sitting on the couch, and then I'll pick some recommendations and buy actually on my laptop, and then I'll continue checking the status on my phone, and then I'll use whatever is supposed. I think it's supposed to be in voice. Maybe use some voice interface to check what the or to leave a comment and give some feedback. Right? To me, as a user, the important thing is that I get that that I get that functionality that I get that I can go through that process. I don't want to. I don't want to start anew if I'm on a different device. I actually care more about all of these things being integrated than about them being cut apart. That's because I'm not watching a movie, right? That's not my use case. My use case is a different one. So I think typically users expect a seamless experience across all channels. They should all be very similar. I, I, I expect to be able to do anything, everything with every channel. And even the channel distinction isn't that even even if you wanted to make it because it's more of a situational aspect kind of thing right I can use my laptop while I'm on the road and I'm, I only have a minute or I can use my phone while I'm on the road or I only have a minute I can also be very relaxed and sitting at home and have an hour time to kill and just use my phone because I'm too lazy to, to you know pick up my laptop or I might not even have a laptop it's what what younger people do, right? They don't understand why old people like naming computers. They have mobile devices that are perfectly fine enough. So assuming that there are completely different use cases on the different de devices is a risky assumption. I don't think it holds true. Here's another one. I think if we look at services that way, then we start, we start building something that sits on a higher level of abstraction. Think of these kinds of things, right? If you build services like this, services that just, just encapsulate some data, you're essentially, essentially just giving people a database driver with a different interface, right? So this is like ODBC or AD.NET or JDBC or what have you in, in this guy. It has an HTTP interface, it gives you some JSON or XML, but it's still just a, a wrapper around a database table. Obviously, that's a bad idea, right? So maybe you want to have something like this, something that encapsulates some domain logic, does some validations, it performs something related to the entities that you have in your database and it does something more intelligent. That sounds better, right? That's more of the kind of services that we want. But what I think is what we really should be looking for are services that actually encapsulate something that is related to the actual process things are used in. It should be higher level. It should be something that helps users achieve a goal that they have as opposed to something that sets a few bits in the database or maybe does a, does a consistent change from one state to another. 
I really want to have something like buy a product. That's, that's not necessarily a single step. That might be a multi-step kind of thing. Actually, I think those are the most useful things. There's, there's a relation about usefulness and reusability that's sadly inverse. If something is, is maximally reusable, it is less useful. I can, I can use it for anything, so it has no specific use, right? If it has a specific use, then it cannot count. You reuse this often, and we have this, this foolish idea that reuse is the thing we need to optimize for, which, it's, which it is not. So I think we should have things at that level. That's the real, that's the kind of services I'm looking for. Right? Because for some reason, people believe that they're building important things, they believe the services matter most, when they actually don't. So this is the view, I also like to call it SOA's original sin. I used to be part of the SOA community for a long time. I advocated against this back then, but still I was probably partially guilty. Because the idea was, that uh, this is, you know, this is the kind of architecture diagram that shows how important our services are. Once we've built the services, we're essentially done, right? It's, I mean, that's the hard part, right? We've built them, we've, you know, we've created insanely great database schemas, and we've built fantastic server-side logic, and we've picked an awesome hypermedia format using JSON, or um, we've created fancy XML schemas for our XML. And the front end is just this little thing that some underqualified, lower paid person does, you know. <laughs> While in reality, that's the case, right? This stuff is completely unimportant without the stuff on top of it. And the stuff on top of it often contains what we believe is in our services. So if we build those anemic, those, those bloodless database wrapping kind of services, we're not including the, the logic the users actually care about, because what the users care about is what helps them do their health to achieve their goal, right? That's that's what they want to see. So we have all this logic in the front end. We've got lots of, and it's written by people. Well, we we people we don't consider to be qualified enough to build those things. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But clearly, this is this is not improved in any way by our services down here. In fact, you could argue that this is actually worse than a monolith because we're paying the price for the services without really having addressed the, the, the actual problem. Right? We, still have, we still have the front end. We, and we actually make it worse by having more than one front end, because we now have this logic separated across multiple front ends that all have a significant piece of the business logic process logic. And now when I need to fix something or change something, I have to change it in multiple places. And this is not improved at all if I have a back end for front end kind of thing, because I'm just cutting things apart for a technical reason, not for a business reason. Can you see the point? Right. We're, we're heavily introducing a new burden by having to, to rebuild those things all the time. Also, you might notice that these are still monoliths, right? We now have multiple front-end monoliths. That's not what we're looking for. I think in an ideal world, we'd be looking for something like this. We would want these vertical slices. I love this, I love this concept. So I agreed with about 90% of what John said in the talk preceding this one which is an insanely great number. It's highly, highly unusual. So I agree with most of what he said. And this is something I strongly disagree with. I couldn't agree more. You know, I have something that has the front and back end parts for this particular piece of domain logic. It allows, it helps me to do everything there, right? And I have, uh, I have multiple UIs, maybe all of them, maybe just some of them. Some, sometimes I might not even need a UI, right? Some things, some services might not have a need for any UI at all because they really are just backend services that are involved synchronously, asynchronously, whatever, whatever suits the purpose. Right? Sometimes you have those things. My, my favorite example of something that will always be synchronous is a security check. If you have, before I send some crazy amount of money to somebody, I want to check that I'm authorized to do so. If that's an external system, that's definitely going to be a synchronous request response call, and that's fine. So sometimes you have those. Ideally, I'd love to have something like this. Vertical responsibility, right? I'm responsible for something end to end. And actually, this line here, this one that cuts these things apart here, is far less important than people think. Separating your front end from your back end might be a good idea, or it might be a bad idea. If you have a browser in front, you always have that separation, because you never have all of the business logic running in the browser, right? There will always be something on the server side. But, so there's the, there, the, the technology 
choice gives you this automatic separation, but you don't have to do that for your services again. There's no need, for, there's, no, there's no absolute need for doing that. You might or you might not. So actually, if you look at these, these vertical slices, you could argue that that is something different from microservices. I'm, I'm undecided. You could say it's a, it's a variant of microservices, it's a, it's a specific kind of microservices, but it's pretty clearly different from the super micro, super, super small 100 line microservices because we now have front end and back end and we have this whole thing of responsibility. It's very much in line with what, with, with what Sean talked about. And actually, the post he linked to, the one that's, that makes the last slide. The last slide talks a bit about those things. And we actually, we and a bunch of colleagues of mine and myself, we set up a site actually where you can, you can read about this very in a little more detail. Actually, the idea here is that um, this is a kind of microservice that embodies the database and the business logic, but also the UI. And it encapsulates a number of tables. I mean, it has a number of, it has a, has a bunch of related functionality, something that actually allows you to do a small part of a more complex business process. So it really is a fully self-contained, complete system that does all of its work without having to touch other systems. So I agree with that as well. It also only talks to other systems by means of, of asynchronous um, coupling. Okay, but I'm not going to go into, much, into too much detail about that because that would be a different talk. I want to talk about UIs. So this is the next important thing that I have. People think front-end technology is an implementation detail. It doesn't really matter what kind of UI you're building, because they're all the same. The arrogance drives me mad. Only back-end people could say something like that. Right? <laughs> only you know, architects like us, senior software developers who never actually build a front would say something like that. This is not at all true. Um, actually, I think that if we really consider things um, deeply, we have to look at more than one platform in a different sense, in the, kind of, in the sense of the, the microservices platform we're talking about. So everybody's just focusing on this thing down here, right? So you can have, you can look at uh, uh, Kubernetes and Mesos and CLS and you know lots of cloud platforms that are on site, on premise and host, whatever. You know, there's a whole. It's, it's you can you can read a few thousand articles each day about this backend platform kind of thing, right? Where we host our microservices that expose some HTTP JSON API, but nobody ever talks about this front end kind of thing. If we want to have decoupled, modularized, split apart front ends, we need to have a platform that achieves something similar to what we have in the back end as well. Right? And this front end kind of platform is very, very different depending on what kind of technology you have, which is kind of obvious. Right? This cannot be an implementation detail, it's, it just can't. Right? So if we look at the back end platform, we have a number of goals. We want this thing to be, you know, we want to make as few assumptions as possible, so we have different implementation technologies, and we don't want to have any implementation dependencies, and it should be a small surface. You know, every service in here should only interact with the outside world by network protocols, and it has its own internal implementation. It's based on standards as much as possible, and it allows for parallel development, so several teams can develop in parallel, which I think is one of the coolest things about this microservices type of thing. We want to be able to deploy independently. We want to be able to operate autonomously. Right? All of those things are taken as a given. Those are those are the requirements for a backend platform. Right? So, what's the front end analogy? What what do we do on the front end side to achieve similar goals? We cannot talk about that without looking at the kind of front end. So, we can separate front ends into these two groups. Right? We've got native and we've got web. Those are really separate things. They're pretty different. You can classify web-based uh, um, UIs more in, along the lines of whether they're rendered on the client or on the server. So something on the server would be a classical web application, something that where HTML is created on the server and sent to the client, to the browser, and the browser renders the HTML. But it's really the server side that does that. Whereas uh, you know this, these more these currently very high things like single-page applications render the HTML on the client and talk to the backend API. So that's a different kind of model. It's both the web application but it's a pretty different model in terms of development. And native apps, of course, can be classified across the kind of device we're talking about. Might be some embedded thing, might be a desktop of a mobile application. Right? So we've got lots of different, lots of different kind of things. And sometimes we even have hybrid systems. So for example, you could have a native shell on a mobile device wrapping a web application of either kind. Right? So it gets pretty complicated pretty soon. But that's, I think, the, the original, that's the connection between this. 
Now, in the web world, regardless of whether it's rendered on the client or rendered on the server, we actually have an excellent integration story. It's a fantastically, it's a fantastic built-in integration story. The web actually is the largest integrated distributed application the world has ever seen. Because when I search for something on Google, I follow a link that sends me to a Facebook page <coughs> from where I go to a product at Amazon that I buy. That's clearly an integration of separate UIs, right? Built by different people independently from each other. So there is something there. There are actually some very, very cool sort of magical integration concepts. My favorite one being the link. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. You have to explain to people what a link is, even though they use it all the time, because nobody thinks of using a link to integrate separate parts, right? If you have separate web applications and you can connect them using a link, it seems obvious, but people don't do it. What people do is they build a single system and try to modularize within, as opposed to modularizing as separate things, which is really sad. It strongly reminds me of the way the web services people felt the urgent need to reinvent Corva on top of HTTP, as opposed to just taking a look at HTTP and notice what's different. Like the browser is pretty similar in that, in that regard. This linking thing, they could be onto something there. So similarly, a link obviously is a very is a very uh, simple mechanism that won't get you very far, right? For some things, you can do that. If everything within your application has has a URI, I'm talking about the front part, right? If everything has a URI. And you can link to that thing. So every other application has a potential link target to link to. That's nice. But sometimes you have got you have got bidirectional communication. You get back to the place you came from. It's actually actually also something we see in a lot of places when we have these redirect games, right? When you used your Twitter account or your Facebook account to log on to some third party, this is what happens, right? You're redirected. Your browser gets redirected to another site. You enter your username and password. Um, and then you're asked, do you really want to give this kind of access to that kind of application? You say, yeah, I'm fine. And then you're redirected back to the original part, and then it's a complicated law of game starts. But essentially, what happens here is the UI integration is then completely based on browser redirects. Again, that is something you can use across company boundaries, but you can also use it to connect separate web UIs that you build to your own systems. Again, that gets a little further than the linking kind of thing, but still not enough. It may still not be sufficient for what you want to do. So here's the next option, which is often called transclusion. Here, the idea is that you have a link embedded in one page. So this one contains a link to that page. But there's actually a little piece of JavaScript here that will resolve that link for you and embed its result within the page. Right? So you don't, you don't, you don't only have a, a single you know, blue underlying anchor you can click on. You actually have the whatever it is. Let's say it's the shopping cart. So this could be the microservice that is responsible for the shopping cart, right? Here's a link to the shopping cart. I'm looking at a product and there's a link to the shopping cart because I have certain things in my shopping cart. But those are separate systems, right? The product, product catalog is a different service from the shopping cart, from the ordering system, right? So when I, when I click that link, I get to this, to this different system. Obviously, I don't want to just have to click the link. So I use JavaScript to follow that link and embed the current preview of the shopping cart within the page of it. So that is a, another mechanism. And we might, we might get some more. There's some interesting stuff coming up in terms of web components, lots, lots of debates on how to actually use them, whether truthfully or not. We'll get to that in a row. But that, that could be some more options of doing it. You know, browser-based, standard-based integration without having to resort to any particular framework. So the browser takes the role of that platform. The browser is sort of the, the server-side Linux part, right? It's the step, it's the, or the virtualization layer. It's what everybody can agree on. It's what everybody has. Because, based or not, most people are building web apps, right? So that's the most obvious choice. And I like that. It allows for independent applications. I can combine, I can connect those things in a very, very loosely coupled fashion. I can actually have two things that are just connected by a link. So if one isn't available, the other one can, can just deliver its HTML and I can look at it and interact with it because as long as I don't click on that link, nothing happens. If I use the transclusion <coughs> mechanism, I just start some sort of spinner, you know, and if that times out, I just hide it. But, you know, the rest of the application still works. That's the kind of resilience I want from my UIs. If I compose the stuff on the server side, or if I make it the client, the build on the client side as a result of multiple server interactions, I get something that's a lot, a, a, has a lot tighter coupling. 
I want things to be loosely coupled, and this is a great strategy for it. It's obviously separately deployable because it's separate applications, right? It's based on the standard platform, up and on the fly, and so on and so on. It works on any device, which is very cool. So, well, when, when we or my company builds systems, when we advise our client, what we typically do is we try to get by with this. We say, okay, let's just spill a web app. We know, we know. Your marketing department told you you need an iOS app. And your developers told you they need an Android app because not all of them have iOS devices. But let's start with a web app because that will reach everyone. And let's just start with a single one. Let's not build two because that's stupid. Nobody should do that anymore. We're building a single thing. We're doing a mobile first, responsive design kind of thing because that is the cool stuff to do these days. It's also pretty great, great and accessible, and people can use it. And then we start from there and we establish uh, separate applications with some shared assets. So for example, for those different applications to look as if they were one, they have to share some topography and colors, iconography and you know, visual elements, but that's pretty much enough. Right? You have to solve signals off from easy with a shared cookie or something if it's on the same domain, but you get them, you get them to be separately developable, they work. You can develop them separately, but they are all connected by means of the same UI strategy. We also try to not share code. So we don't share assets in terms of a push model. We actually have them important and when, when, they, when they need them, right? So it's always pull versus push. You never have, you don't have a central team that makes changes to all of the services. The services themselves, the service teams themselves, decide when they want to pull the changes that somebody has made to the central style guys or the asset library, or the pattern library. So, we sacrifice some efficiency, because that's what you do once you start decoupling. Right? A decoupled system is always less efficient than a tightly coupled one, but it's easier to develop, and easier to maintain, and better in the long run. So that's what we're doing. Right? And we get by with small front ends, loosely coupled. I actually think this is the best possible way to reach your life. If you can stop here, that's awesome. When I, when I thought about this, I, I remember that I recently read this very cool quote. I had to insert it. doesn't really belong here, but I had to insert it. Maciej Zyglowski, you should read everything he ever wrote. Just look up that guy, he's absolutely fantastic. And he wrote this as a strategy, right? If you're, if you're building a web app, make sure the most important elements of the page download and render first. It's strongly connected to my point because with this approach, you don't have to build an app shell, right? You don't have to build something that does the integration because the browser does the integration. So your individual web application still delivers its content, delivers the most important part. According to him, stop there. I like that idea. Now, with this approach, with these small web front ends loosely coupled, I can address some aspects, but I have some something left, right? So. Let's say I have addressed the web app and I've addressed this part because that's very nicely, that works very nicely together. Actually, it's rendering on a server model is the classical web model for a reason because it's the one that's best in line with the web architecture. All this REST thing that you've ever read about that's kind of a given on the server side, if you really want to follow it, you need to do this, not that. Because this is just a, this is like RPC. We'll get to that later. Now, I can, I can do this. I can also have a hybrid app, right, that matches this nicely. I can, I can have a shell, like a native, maybe I need to install something in the app store, right? So I'll have a small wrapper application that just embeds a web view and gives me the page from the server side. For a lot of use cases, that's perfectly fine, because actually the marketing department just cares about having something in the app store, and the rest of the world just wants the stuff to be accessible, and you can't do anything without the server anyway, so that often is very good. Sometimes it's not. If it's not, then you have to do something else. So what is it that we do with these other, other technologies? What we typically do is we build monoliths. Right? So we build a native app, let's say an iOS app, and that's one iOS app. That's because there is no modularization strategy in the App Store approval process. There is no modularization strategy on your phone, weirdly enough. Now some people are trying and they they start to build something like links into the apps, but it's, it's a joke compared to the capabilities of the browser. You still, your marketing department tells you, your marketing department tells you you have to have something in the app store, you better do that. So, sometimes you can. And maybe the front end monolith is okay, right? But sometimes that's perfectly fine. Because in general, sometimes monoliths are perfectly fine. It's not as if the monolith is always a bad choice. I think a good monolith is a great choice because a good monolith only has only bundled stuff together 
that can be handled together, you know, where it makes sense to have one team work on it, which can be released as one thing, that's all fine. If that is the case, then the monolith is okay, and that's true both in the back end as well as in the front end. So don't waste your time modularizing something if it doesn't merit being modularized, because it's going to cost you. So native front ends resemble server monoliths. It's a native monolithic application, which is basically every native application, right? Then, you, then you've got those things. You've got other strategies to, to modularize, right? So you can, you can see the goals from one of the last slides, right? Um, what we can do is we can modularize internally, as in any monolith. It's not as if every monolith is just a huge block of one thing, right? It has modules or packages or bundles or, or whatever it is, plugins, whatever it is that you used before microservices came along, right? If you look at a complex program, it typically has some sort of internal modularization. And of course, you can do the exact same thing in your in your native monolith. And so you can you can you can get close to some of these ideas. So for example, you could have different teams build parts of the monolithic application. Like you had different teams building different packages in your monolithic server app. Right? You could use some platform interface, intents on the Android platform, whatever it is they have on the iOS platform, I don't know. You can or, synchronize those teams using release trains, and you can enforce some discipline. You can all do that. <coughs> it's going to be just as great or just as bad as whatever you did on your server model before. Now, I'm sorry about that. I can't solve it, because the native platforms don't solve it. Right? There's, the only platform that I'm aware of that has a, good, has a really good answer to this is the web, which is why I like it. So, you know, we've sort of covered this with a sort of non-answer, because what I'm telling you is there's only organizational discipline and internal modularization. There is no microservices if you have a single monolithic front-end platform. The back-end, sure, not in the front-end part, but I think I got across, I got that across. Which leaves my personal pet peeve, the last thing, right, rendered on the client. You know, we have something <coughs> where, where a client application takes control, because obviously, you know, JS-centric, Java-centric web apps, the new, the new breed of web apps, they can be as good as native apps. Which is kind of a very stupid thing to say, right? They should be as bad. I don't see any need to emulate the bad parts of native applications within web applications. Why is it better to have a monolithic web application when the web, when the browser as a platform has these awesome features? I don't get it. I don't understand it. It drives me mad. So, I'm being slightly dogmatic here, but only slightly. My comparison is this, we have these web we have, we have this web service kind of thing, right? You know, web, web in quotes, air quotes, web service. They used HTTP purely as a transport. So you could, instead of HTTP, I'm talking about SOAP web services, right? You could, instead of HTTP, use some messaging system or SMTP or even files. It ignores HTTP verbs, so you can do no caching. It ignores URIs, so you have no linking. Um, it has this single endpoint, you know, here's where the web ends. That's what endpoint means, right? So you get to this endpoint and there is the only thing. It completely fails to embrace the web. That's what web services did. And luckily, surprisingly, the industry found that out and actually changed its view. Web services were, I very clearly remember that, were a hot thing, the thing to do. Everybody had to do web services. I'm guilty of having made quite a bit of money with that because we did consulting for web services back then. There was a lot of consulting to be done because nobody could get this crap to work. So, <laughs> web services. And web app, you know, in the sense of a badly built single page application, not all of them are equal. But a badly built single <coughs> application does the exact same thing. It uses the browser purely as a runtime. It just happens to be in a ridiculously deployed runtime that's available everywhere, so you can you can you know instead of instead of having people install Flash, you're just you know they have a browser, so you use that. <coughs> It, it breaks all the things, you know, you can't do forward, back, refresh buttons without, you know, getting weird results. Um, it, it doesn't expose links, again, the badly build this, you, know, you could build them in a better way. Um, it has this monolithic app at one single endpoint, right? So I have this URI, but the URI doesn't mean I'm linking to something within the application, it means I'm linking to the application as a whole, as I was linking to the service here. It completely fails to embrace the browser, which is really sad, because it's such a great platform. I think this is just this is just wrong. You should do things differently. Let me redraw that diagram differently here. If I look, look at those four layers, then it's actually there's a there's a very cool separation here in the default web architecture that says I have this 
declarative way of rendering something on the server side in a way that's largely independent from the capabilities of the client. That semantic HTML on the server, it doesn't care whether it's rendered by a mobile phone or a PlayStation or you know some other device or even a desktop or laptop machine doesn't care. But you have the logic here where it belongs because any logic you put on the client you have to duplicate here anyway because you can never trust in the client. <coughs> you have very clear uh, separation of concerns. You have this awesome hypermedia format. It's another thing that drives me completely mad. You have this idea of you know hypermedia format. This is a brief slide for the rest people among you, right? Hypermedia, that's cool. That's the cool thing to do. Everybody agrees it's cool, right? Except the swagger people. But everybody likes that. So we use HTML. That could be one option because HTML is a hypermedia format. But that's pretty cool. It has all the stuff built in. It's you know it's the stuff hypermedia was reverse engineered from as a well, you know, the, the rest dissertation actually was after the back. Right? So this is pretty cool. Or we just invent our own JSON-based incomplete clone of HTML and use that instead. Because we want to do hypermedia, we don't want to use HTML because HTML is somehow bad on the server side. It's better to have it in JSON because that's so much easier to read for some reason. You know, if our clients need to be RESTful, we could just use the browser and that's a RESTful client. It's already been built. You know, it's already built into the systems we have. Somebody has taken great pains to build a fantastic machine that can use declarative information to drive 3D accelerated graphics hardware on your devices. That's awesome. That's a DSL for your supercomputer. You can just use it or, you know, you can invent your own buggy implementation. I do this. There are, so, there are so many cool options. You know, my favorite one is, my favorite way of using the browser is using what's called unobtrusive JavaScript. So I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Have you heard of unobtrusive JavaScript as a concept? No JavaScript people here, so let me thrill you with the awesome capabilities of the browser of JavaScript. If I have something like this, that's a piece of HTML that gives me a select box. It renders this ugly thing where nobody can remember how to get how to do multi-selection, right? If you have press command or opt to shift or I have to try it out. And with a piece of JavaScript like this, that is goes into a JavaScript file for every single, you know, once for every one of those things, you turn into something like this. So the browser has a story of turning server-side HTML into fancy JavaScript components. The application looks just as fancy as if it had been built as a single page app. It's the exact same user experience. That's not my point. I don't hate JavaScript. I think JavaScript is fantastic. But the control, the aggregation, the integration should be done by the browser because that's what it's for. You shouldn't build your own clone of the browser in JavaScript running on top of the browser because that is stupid. So my my version of green spawning is this one, right? Maybe if you, if, you, if you want to do a really good job, you end up building the same thing on top of the same thing. It's like building a messaging system on top of a messaging system. You could just use the messaging system. It seems like a better choice. So, got another slide. You can take a look at that. It's another talk. I could spend an hour or so talking about Roca, resource learning plan. Actually, has a lot of recommendations on building web applications in this unobtrusive, progressively enhanced fashion, as opposed to building them with a Java-centric approach, while still using JavaScript for what it's used for. But if you just happen to have bet your career on AngularJS, or because that's totally 2015 now on React, or maybe Ember, or whatever it is, right? Then that's fine with me as well. Well, not really. I have a long rant about why I hate SDAs down there. I'll put up the slides. Um, so, I'm not an SDA fan, but even if you like single page apps, even if you like those frameworks, I urge you to not build a single single page app. Right? Because then you have to think of the integration story yourself. If your application is large enough to merit being modularized, maybe it's not. But if it is, then use the browser's integration features to connect your different SDAs, because that, awesomely enough, allows you to have multiple single-page apps built using different frameworks. Isn't that cool? Sort of reminds me of the whole microservice idea, right? That I don't have to make an implementation choice for everything at once that I'll regret in a year, but I can actually change my mind within, within each single thing. So, do that, right? Some trade-off. Um, Avoid modularity on a Java EE. You know, if people tell you that, well, Angular or Ember or any of those has this fantastic integration story, it's the same thing like the Java EE people telling you that they have such a great EJV concept, or the OSGI people telling you that they have, they've been doing microservices for 15 years. They do tell you that. So let me summarize this. 
I think that very, very few organizations actually are in the business of delivering APIs. If that's your job, you can ignore everything I've said, because you don't have to care about UIs. That's not what most of us do, so that's an educated guess. Right? I think most of us are in the business of building something that actual humans use. So you should think about that. And it's, it's, it drives me crazy that people still think the front end part is something unimportant, something that doesn't deserve architecture, something that doesn't deserve at least as much, as much attention as the back end does. Because it very clearly does. We have super smart people who are front end architects, and that's actually our most important skill right now. We have way too few of them, and we can't find any. So if anybody wants to work in Germany, I have some jobs to offer you. So we're looking for those people, and they're really hard to find because it's really hard to find someone who's both you know, somewhat talented in the front end part, but also has an architect's mind of building something that's more and well made. Front end models may be OK, right? <coughs> Just as back end models are maybe OK. But if you, if, you're, if, you want it, if you think that you need a modularization strategy, if you think that you need to cut your stuff apart into, into separate things, then you can't stop at the back end. That makes no sense at all. It's probably the least important part that you can modularize. And actually, I have a lot of failed SOA initiatives to prove my point. Right. If you only do the back end part, it's not going to end up like it, as anything that anybody can use for, use for anything useful. Nothing beats the browser, the browser capabilities with regards to the modular front. And people tend to ignore that because you know mostly I think are ignorant. We're not aware of what, what an awesome platform this is. So I, I'd like to encourage you to take a closer look at that, take a look at the options, and don't just blindly follow some framework's lead. Because every time you pick a framework or a library, you inherit the architecture that those people who built it thought was good at the time when they built it. They might not even agree with, them, with, with themselves anymore. And you, even worse, might not even be aware of the architectural decisions that they made. Because you're just building something, you're just taking something that's the most popular. So obviously, it's an industry standard. So everybody, actually, I have a colleague of mine told me, he had somebody tell him, well, React is an industry standard now. Come on, this thing is just, I don't know, two years old? I thought this kid, whatever. Just don't do that. If you don't do it on the server side, on the server side, you can come used to not making yourself dependent on any particular implementation, don't do the same thing on the client side. So, that's all I have. Um, thanks. <laughs> any questions or comments or disagreements? Yes, I'm please. curious to know, like, one of the things that uh, some of the front-end frameworks <laughs> do very well is introduce their framework and do documentation on how to use it and get you along uh, on that. Are there any equivalent things with, you know, other than reading a ton of RFCs, yeah. is there a way to easily get into something very rich and full-featured about that platform that you just described? Well, so one problem is that um, I'm telling you not to rely on a framework or a library, and I don't have a documentation, document framework or library that proves why this is a good idea, because that would sort of be totally beside the point, right? But it's so I, I get the feeling, and I get the question a lot. So we, we try to do something, and it's far from perfect. I actually think it's, uh, it's even, even far, uh, more far, whatever. Let me just show you what we have. So we have this thing, it's called Roca. It has, uh, has some, dis some description about what you should do on the server side and client side to um, build a single vertical slice. So this is not yet related to microservices. This is the vertical part about how to build the web UI so that it aligns with the browsers and with the web's architecture. That's this part. You can explore that. It has some rules. So again, it's just, you know, this is just rules so that you can claim that you adhere to this or disagree with it explicitly. Say, we're not doing this because we think it's stupid. That's fine as well. It serves its purpose if it clearly defines that concept, right? That you can make an educated decision here. And it has some things like, for example, an FAQ that might, might answer some, some things related to that. And it also has a set of libraries. Now, those libraries are small JavaScript libraries that all use this progressively enhancing, this unobtrusive approach. So for example, if you look at something like, um, I don't know, accessible tabs, right, that turns an HTML table into a fancy interactive JavaScript thing, but it's a small thing. This is not a complete thing. It's not a single stock 
framework solution because that will be beside the point, right? The idea is that you combine those things to form something that's more useful. That will be the vertical part of things. And we also took the second thing for the horizontal part, so that's called self-contained systems. That's the idea of having separate applications, and each of those applications, following the model that Sean explained, with or without the CPRS part, that would be an internal decision there. Right? The, the, this, the single slice has the data, with the logic with the Y, and this, this slide says a little bit about how to how to link those things. So that's that's our attempt at you know giving you something to take a look at. And it has links to articles and presentations, and it has a Twitter account. You know what you do what you do for marketing purposes. But there's nothing to sell, maybe except for consulting. But there's no no product. And actually, we've made sure that we had lots of contributors. So we have like, clients of ours and competitors of ours, and you know friends and partners and people we know contributing to both sides to help us refine the concept and make it useful. One of the things, like, I mean, you're, you're just an Angular, but like one of the things that Angular gives you is it gives you a consistency of how you build your UI. Whereas if you're starting to mix and match different libraries from different, you know, different authors, you, well, you know, well, like I've done Angular apps now. I've never done a single page Angular app, but I, you know, I like Angular yeah. you know, because it gives me that consistency. So I think it does two different things. One is it, uh, well, first of all, one thing that it doesn't do is give you a consistent UI. For that, you would need a front-end framework like Bootstrap, for example. Yeah, right? so so but, it, but so they, I, I, they I like tie those. together very well. Well, what I think what it gives you is it gives you a model for building all of your logic in JavaScript. And the model I'm suggesting is that you don't need to do that. So I don't have the need for something like Angular because it's being done in a different way. So how can I explain that? Actually, what you what you do when you when you build when you're building something with Angular, you're building a lot of uh, a lot of logic in the client. That's sort of the point, right? You have something that a lot of gives structure to the way you build logic in the client. Well, I don't I mean, want logic in the client. I mean, I don't I, have logic in the client. Yeah, a lot of well, well, when I do it with Angular, it's it's usually the validation logic, you know, the yeah, form validation right. and stuff like that. You don't want to have to do a web submit. To know the control. Sure. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. So I draw the line. It's actually one of the Roca things from this side. There's one principle. I don't know where. I, I use. I, see, I use Roca. Oh. Okay. But I, it's obviously been updated in the last two years. I mean, that, that's probably true. Yeah. So the, the, one of the thing, one of the ideas here is that um, you do only do very limited validation in the yeah. clients. That's the kind of validation that you can do declaratively. So if I can code in the HTML something like this is an email address or this has yeah. the following regular expression. Then some JavaScript project of a client that uses that declarative information to build a powerful component is awesome. And if you build that using Angular, perfectly fine. Yeah. That's just the use of a library, you know. But Angular, in, in that model, Angular doesn't take the role of, you know, it doesn't it doesn't doesn't sit in the driver's seat. I still do the validation on the server. Anyway. Exactly, you have to do it anyway, right? The real validation you have to do it. On the and server there are anyway. the business constraints, or exactly. As soon as you have something like you all notice, if you have something like a when. When there's a value less than 2,000 in that field and a value more than 3,000 in that one, I have to select a region with that uh, restriction in that. I never build that on the client because it sucks to have that on the client because you have it on the client and the server and you have to maintain both. So I always do that with an AJAX call to the server, right? So the server does the validation. I don't re-render the page because that would be stupid, right? But I, I still maintain the, the I, I adhere to the rule that every real business logic has to be on the server. <coughs> And I feel that, that many people lose this restriction when they just blindly follow the model. Let's just build everything in JavaScript. Like you have, there's a, there is a there is clear architecture in the in the web and in the browser in the role that HTML and CSS and JavaScript have. And JavaScript's role, role is actually enhancing the user experience, not taking complete control over it. In my view, of course, that's just my view. You can believe wherever you like, and if you talk to somebody who's only doing Angular or only doing Ember or only React, they'll strongly disagree with me. Which I think it's kind of fun part of it. <laughs> More questions? Maybe one last? Yes. Um, is it possible to get good UX with that sort of at the glass, you know, at the browser style interaction? Because there have been a lot of attempts at it in previous years, you know, with portlets, client side portlets. Um, the, I don't know the, so I think the gotcha is, and I've done a few of them, that, that the UX has never been as good as, as a, you know, a good, the ones I've seen, really, in my experience, yeah. uh, as, a, as, a, as a good, like, well-designed front-end uh, app using SPA, or not, sorry, SPA, multiple SPA patterns. Well, I, well I, first of all, I think there is, a, there, is a, there is a point to be made that a web app 
will never have the exact same user experience as a native app. Sure. And that, nothing can, well, soon, short of the browser having all the features of the native platform, this will never change, right? There always, will, will always be a restriction. Also, native apps typically are built in a non-dynamic language, right? So you have a little performance advantage there as well. You can use all the platform, they typically not build cross-platform. They will always have an edge. Right, so I think if, you, if your goal is to have the absolute best user experience possible on a particular device, you have to build a native app. I think most of the time you can't afford to do that. Maybe you can't afford it for one platform, but you have to you have to serve the others as well. So I think in most business scenarios, you start with a web app because that's the only thing that reaches everyone, and then you build a native app for for the cases where you can really justify spending the extra. Now within the web within the web platform. I don't see any reason why a, a system built with uh, unobtrusive JavaScript, server-side HTML should be any less performant or any less great than a single page app. That's really not the distinction. It, it, may, it may, may appear that way, but it's really not. Because you're using the same platform, the same programming language, the same visual controls, the same browser APIs, you can build everything in the same way. The question is just, is the is the framework into which everything is embedded, is that the browser controlled by the HTML, or is it a JavaScript application implemented in JavaScript running in the browser? That's the, but it's not, you know, everything else is similar. I guess the thing you need is very strong design principles and governance to get you there, basically. I, yeah, I would say you need that anyway, right? Yeah, that, yeah but yeah. perhaps when, when you're using one framework, it kind of enforces some of that on you. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think you lose a lot. And we also have to, have to see that uh, it's also, this, is a, this is a timeline involved as well. So we're comparing applications we built five years ago yeah, sure. to single page apps we build today. Yeah. But if we use the principles from five years ago with, today browsers, with, to, with today's browsers, mm -hmm. you get an awesome experience, right? Because browsers have become great. They've become yeah. absolutely fantastic. And they don't suck as much as they did a decade ago. Mm -hmm. But still people remember them like that. Are, are there any good examples of... of of sites built with that, we could look at it. So a good, good example is all of the Basecamp stuff. You know right. any of that? Yeah. Right? So the Basecamp people have very nice applications. I think they work very, very well. Uh, they have awesome mobile applications that are just hybrid. Right? They've got this cool thing called Turbolinks. Turbolinks 5 is the new version that will just uh, uh, turn every link, every page, uh, uh, page change into an embedded page refresh. There's a lot of pretty cool technology out there. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, we can have a discussion afterward, but let's close the official part right now.